to you this morning, and if you did, would you open up this morning? We're going to be in the book of Malachi. Malachi is where we are on Sunday mornings, working verse by verse. We hope you brought a Bible, and if so, you're making your way there. Last book uh, of the Old Testament. If you got in this morning, you didn't bring a Bible, we have provided for you. And the chairs in front of you, Bibles are there, got a page number on the screen, so you can get there really rapidly. We hope you would. You can use electronic device if you want to follow along that way, but one way or another, we're inviting you to the Word of God. We're wanting you to hear and see what God would have for you. So that invitation is here this morning. That's in our overflow. That's online. That's if you're watching this later. We really want to take a moment and just encourage you to open up a Bible so that you're hearing what God has to say through his word. You know, we think about it on Sunday mornings. That's what we do. We work through the Bible. We work through books of the Bible, one verse at a time. Uh, we believe in that. We cover what God has for us. Um, and yet, I just wanted just to say it, even as we head into it, Boy, there's just so much happening right now. I mean, I certainly found myself, uh, you know, spending time before the Lord this week. Like, Lord, you know, we have so much. I mean, is there a special message? We did that last week. Uh, but in the midst of it, just was encouraged again to this space. God has given us his word. And there's power in working through it. And just believe that in this moment, he would meet you in a way that would take his word and connect it right to where you are. He is so powerful to do that. He is so good to do that, but let's ask him for it. Would you join me in prayer? Let's go to him and ask that he would take what we talk about this morning and he would shape it in a way that both opens up your understanding to God's truth, but in that makes it just meet you right where you are. Father, we come to you and we ask for it right now. I thank you for your word that is alive and active. I thank you that everything we need is here. There's not anything that is extra. There's not anything that's missing. Lord, as we approach this section this morning, I recognize you've given to us with purpose and power. I ask that that would work. Into us, shaping us, helping us, forming us. God, you gave this to us, so help us to understand what you're saying. But in the midst of it, Lord, would you speak to your people right where they are? Would you take your word and by the power of the Spirit just draw us to you and what you're saying to us in a way that we'll, we will know that you've heard us, you've seen us, and you apply your word to us. God, would you do that right now? We ask for it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ignorance is not always bliss. Hey, can we just understand this for a moment? Sometimes ignorance is just downright dangerous. Oh, let's say you were sitting down at a, at a meal and somebody was serving food and it's poisoned. I mean, it's like it, it's going to kill you in the midst of it. Your ignorance is about to cost you your life. Sometimes ignorance is dangerous. And certainly that is so in our text this morning. God is just speaking to Israel, and he's certainly speaking to us. And in part of what he wants to help us understand is that there's an ignorance that is plaguing them. An ignorance that has them irreverent. Irreverent? Yeah, that's what we want to see this morning. As we do so, let me just remind you really quickly. We're in the book of Malachi. We're working through it verse by verse, and we have titled this series, A Timely Conversation with God. We really do believe it's timely. Uh, this is the last book of the Old Testament. We believe it has prophetic implications into the last moments of time that I think we're living in. I think there's prophetic realities that are here for us to hear. And in that, God is invited into a conversation. That's always true. God is seeking to have a conversation with us. But one of the unique things uh, about the book of Malachi is it flows back and forth. Uh, as uh, God raising things and them answering. So we're kind of imagining it in that framework of a, of a messaging, you know, between us and God. And he is wanting just to take it and have a conversation with them. A conversation about where they are and what they need to understand. In this conversation that we highlight into this morning, he begins it by raising this thought. He says in verse 6, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts. Hey, pause there. 
he raises the question. He raises the thought of where's my honor? Where is what that looks like? Now, we want to explore what God is going to be talking about. But before we do so, can we back up one more space and just remind you that that's not how it began. The very first thing that God began to talk to them about that we talked about a couple weeks ago is he says in verse 2, I have loved you. This is powerful. It's powerful because he helps understand that, but it also frames the entire conversation. This is how the conversation begins, that God is telling him, hey, I love you. I, I, I love you, and I love you enough to have this conversation with you. Why is that so needed? Well, if you don't keep this in your thought, you're going to hear this conversation that God is going to have with them, with us, and you're going to think God's having a bad day. You're going to think he's mad. You're going to think he's just, oh, he's, he's really upset. He's not. The tone of his voice is like, I love you. And I love you enough to have a conversation that we need to have. I, I, and the reason I'm talking to you about it, God is saying, is because I care. Because I absolutely do love you. I hope you would hear that this morning and you would hear it in the midst of the conversation. Okay, well, let's come back to it. So God begins it and he does so really, really just simply. I mean, he just reasons with them in the most simple easy framework, not impossible, really easy for all of us to understand, right? He just raises this idea where he says, okay, in our world, verse six, a son honors his father. I mean, it's supposed to be that way. Many times it is. Kids, you know, have respect for their parents. Uh, servants, their master. Employees, their bosses. I mean, there's a respect that should flow there. By God's grace, it should. But then God just asks. So if I am that, if I'm a father, and he is, if he's the master, and he is, where's mine? Where, where's, where's, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my reverence? I mean, he reasons with them in many ways that in, in this framework that there's a, a space that he is highlighting to them that they are failing to really honor him as who he is. In fact, he goes so far as to say not only is they, are they not honoring him, they're despising him. Hey, go back and read it. Picking it up in the middle of the verse, it says, if I am a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my reverence, says the Lord of hosts. To you priests, the spiritual leaders who are supposed to be representing God, he says, you despise my name. Wow. Hey, pause there. It's a pretty serious accusation. It's a pretty serious just indication of where they are that God is highlighting to them and saying there's something altogether wrong here that there's a failure for them to, to honor him as who he is, to see him as who he is, that they've despised his name. Well, in this conversation, they respond. Pick it up there at the end of verse 6. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Like they answer, they look on this whole thing, they respond to this and they say, how? Like, how are we doing this? And this is important. If God will help me to unpack this here and throughout the morning, one of the keys to this is that they actually don't know. One of the shocking realities is this is not one of those questions that uh, finds them uh, just playing coy kind of thing. This is not like one of those parental things where you, you know, kind of walk into the room and you find the broken vase and you're like, who broke it? And they're like, I don't know. You know, like, like they actually know, but they just, nobody wants it. That's not this. It's put in the, in the way that has the idea that they're like, wait, what? Like how? Like how are we doing that? They literally are unaware at this moment of how that's playing out in them. And see, I want to put to you this morning that that's one of the really dangerous things in the age that you and I live. So when we began the, the book of Malachi, for some of you who are here, when we did our, that initial study, we talked a little bit about uh, the prophetic implications, how this book finds itself again at the end of the Old Testament, probably tying into the very, even the last of our days before Jesus comes back. And we noted that one of the similar sections is the letters that Jesus writes in the book of Revelation. He has seven letters that he writes, and the last letter uh, may have very specific prophetic implications for the last days uh, of the people before Jesus comes back. And in that letter, he writes to him and tells him this. 
He says, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They're ignorant. Uh, that's what Jesus is saying. He says, you don't understand. You, you have no idea. Like, you don't seem to grasp how bad off this is. You're ignorant of it. And, and so if I'm right, uh, that's one of the fundamental realities that move through our day, this place of ignorance, this place where they don't understand. So God's going to unpack it for them, help them to understand a little bit why this is such a serious deal. Go back and pick it up. Verse 7, God says, you offer defiled food on my altar. Pause there. I mean, he's saying, here's the thing. One of the things you're doing is you are bringing to me food or sacrifices, that which they would do. And he says, it's defiled. Uh, it's unacceptable. It's that which, is, which God would look upon and find it completely unpleasing. But again, they ask the question, in what way have we done that? In what way have we defiled you? I mean, how has that happened? How has that actually been in the midst of that? And it's worth noting, they understand it's against him. I mean, even in the midst of it, because God had said, you're defiling my altar. And they said, so how are, we, how are we doing that to you? What are we doing that has us with that kind of disrespect, with that kind of dishonor? I mean, they really don't know. Hey, pause and just think about it for a moment. See, there are things right now that if I asked you, hey, what's wrong in your life? What would you, you know, what, what's wrong in those places that you would look and say, hey, God doesn't like it. And I'm just going to say, without asking you to raise your hands, probably most of us here this morning are like, ah, there's a few things. <laughs> there's a few things I know God's working on. That's important. I mean, by God's grace, may you work on it. But here's the scary thing. What is it you're absolutely unaware of? Like, things aren't good. And you don't even know they're not good. Well, there, there's something wrong. And you don't even understand what that is. And that's what God's highlighting here. And so he wants to help them understand it. So they're asking the question, like, how have we done this? What are we doing that is despising you or defiling you? God says it in verse 7. He says, by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the, the lame and the sick, is it not evil? So there's a number of ways to unpack this, but maybe one of them is just understanding that by part of what they're doing is that there's an unholiness in the way that they're approaching God. They are saying, God puts it into language, he says, you're saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now, again, just kind of thinking this through with you, probably nobody said those exact words. I mean, it wasn't like, oh yeah, I heard that yesterday. <laughs> like, that's ex no, the idea is their actions were speaking louder than their words. He says, and you're treating this this way. You, you have a contempt, uh, a, a lax of just kind of look at this place of coming before me. Now, quick FYI, he talks about it as the table of the Lord. It says there in verse seven, that they're saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. For you Bible students, just quickly giving it to you, he's probably not talking about the table of showbread. Some of you are like, is that what we're talking about? Like the Old Testament, the tabernacle? No, it's not. He's using it more as a metaphor, uh, much like we would use today, the idea of what we're bringing to God, like what we're placing on the table. Uh, and it really does come across that simply. And the idea is that what he's, the things that they're bringing and offering to him, he says, you're treating me this way. One of the things that's important is understanding that to do so is to treat God casually, kind of despising, not recognizing the, his holiness, not recognizing what it is to come before him. And one of the realities that finds itself weaving through the entirety of the Old Testament is that God is calling his people when they approach him, no matter how they're coming, that they do so in light of who he is, that they do so in light of, of, of what he is as a holy and righteous God. So much so that even a good offering, if you want to think about it that way, can be tainted uh, by, by someone who's not coming to God in a way of honoring and respecting him. Let me just give you one verse that I could give you dozens. Uh, he gives it to us this way in Leviticus. It says, moreover, the person who touches any unclean thing, 
such as human uncleanness or an unclean animal or any abominable unclean thing, and who eats the flesh of a sacrifice of the peace offering that belongs to the Lord, that person shall be cut off from his people. Okay, so just kind of track with me here again. We could spend a bunch more time on it in verses, but I think it's not as hard to get to as we want to get there. But the Bible gives it to us this way, that even if you're doing the right thing, even if you were bringing the right sacrifice and, and you were doing it, but you're defiled. I mean, you've been defiled by uncleanness in those spaces. It would be their ritual uncleanness or sinful uncleanness. And, and that's, you don't deal with that. And you just come and offer the sacrifice. God says, I'm not going to accept it. Like you're, the state of who you are has messed up what you're bringing. Like I can't accept it from you because you're not in the right space. So some of it, they just come into God and they're not recognizing this. They're not recognizing his holiness. But it's not just who they are. It is actually what they're bringing. Oh, you saw it already. We think about what he, what he talks about and he says, uh, when, you, when you offer, in verse 8, the blind is a sacrifice. Is it not evil? And when we offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? So the couple ways that they're really doing this is, one, they're not honoring God uh, as they come and bring the sacrifices, and they're actually bringing things that were unacceptable. So here's again where we struggle. Some of you, you're like absolutely here. I mean, all I have to do is explain that. Others of you are like, wait, what? I'm not, I mean, maybe you don't know your Bible. You don't know your Old Testament. You don't know how it works. So let me give it to you as quick as I can and as simple as I can. Sacrifice is in the Old Testament. If you were to bring a sacrifice to God, it was meant to be unblemished. It was meant to be perfect. For example, just Leviticus would say it this way. You shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish. That's important. From the cattle, from the sheep or the goats, uh, whatever has a defect, no. You're not going to give that to God. You're not going to give that as an offering because it will not be acceptable to give that to God. God says, no, you're like, you can't bring me those things. If you're going to bring a sacrifice, it has to be unblemished. Lots and lots and lots of reasons for us. But let's just begin with the biggest, because if we can get it here, it'll help everything else make sense. It all pictures Jesus. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament pictures who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us. And Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. Uh, he has a perfect sacrifice. There is no sin. There's nothing in him. It's his sinlessness that in part gives us our hope. And so everything in the Old Testament prefigures that. And so every sacrifice does that. So ultimately we would, we would recognize, no, it has to be because ultimately Jesus would be. But let's also just think about it practically. Part of the idea was recognizing how just damaging and dangerous sin was. To come and offer a sacrifice was to offer something that would pay for that or atone for that or at least kind of deal with that from an Old Testament standpoint. But you did it because you recognized it was costly. You did it because you recognized God was altogether worthy and that you were bringing him was to be an expression of that. So it flowed through the entire sacrificial system. You know, we, we think about what that looks like and, and, and how it works, like just emphasizing everything he is in the midst of that. And we would just look at the other side of it to give God the other, which is what he's accusing them of, the lame, the sick, you know, the, the things that, that, that would be that way. It is to give to God just that which is unwanted, that doesn't cost us anything, to give God that, that would be in a sense of, of just bringing that to God that you had, it had no good in your life. I mean, again, I know it's hard to even maybe imagine, but you can try to, if you will, imagine with me, you know, a shepherd that has his sheep and he gets one of these sickly sheep that really is going to be good for nothing. I mean, he can't really take care of it. Uh, it's not going to be something he can sell, not going to get a lot of money after he's like, just give it to God. <laughs> you know, win-win. You know, God gets it, and then I don't have to. I mean, it was, it, it's a space of giving to God that which is unholy and unacceptable and misses the entire thing. And God is saying, hey, that's what they're doing. They've literally just dropped into a space that at this moment in history, when God writes it through Malachi, I mean, things have fallen into such a space that this is where it is. Now, it shouldn't have been. I mean, I think that should be clear. In fact, it was one of the callings of the Levitical priesthood and the Levites in the day. This was supposed to be their job. 
Like it was one of the things, like you were to bring, bring a sacrifice and one of the things they were supposed to do was inspect it and be like, mm, no, not gonna work. You know, no, you can't give that. I mean, this is fundamentally one of the things they're there for, but somehow it's fallen into such a space that they're like, fine. <laughs> like, at least you brought something, you know? And, and, and at this moment in history, it's there. Now, again, I, I try to imagine it and maybe spend just a moment on it that we could spend a lot more. I try to imagine how they got to such a space. Maybe how the conversations would have looked like. For you guys who are with us in that first week or have an understanding of where we are, much has happened. Israel had gone into captivity uh, for their sin. They've come out of the Babylonian captivity now, but honestly, only a small portion. Only a small portion of, of, the, of the Jews who are in Capitol are back in the land now. It's taken a while. They've rebuilt the temple. They've rebuilt the land. They're trying to worship God, but they are the minority in the entire world. And in one sense, I can almost imagine the conversations, you know? It's like, hey, it'd be great if I could give more, but this is all I can give, you know? I mean, and maybe the priests are like, hey, at least it's something. <laughs> I mean, at least somebody's bringing something, you know? I mean, this is, you know, you know I mean, if, if, we, if we really held that high standard, I mean, we, we'd have to, it would do nothing. And, you know, we have to walk where people are. I mean, we have to kind of, you know, be relevant into the, to, to those spaces. And we have to kind of accept this. And maybe somehow they have talked themselves into a space that they find it to be acceptable, but God does not. In fact, as he's giving it to us, he just brings it back to them. And he's, again, just reasoning in the most practical way. And he says it this way in the middle of verse 8. He says, offer it then to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of, Lord of hosts. He says, I'll tell you what. Try treating you know, your governor the way you're treating me. Take him, this blind, this sick, this lame you know, animal, and find out if he would find that to be acceptable. Now, again, if you have any kind of imagination, uh, it's just kind of fun to think it through. Could you imagine it? Like somebody's doing it, like, you know, they, they get invited into the, you know, most powerful person in the land at that time, and they're going to cook him a meal. And so they decide, hey, I've been wanting to get rid of that lamb. You know, he's a sickly little thing, you know, and yeah, and they decide to cook it up and they do it and they, they do it out there, but the meat's kind of green, you know, and it's kind of like a little bit, you know, you know, a little, and they're like, hey, it has cancer, but you know, it's you're probably going to be fine. You know, I mean, really, you know, go ahead. You know, just thought I would give you this. I just want you to try to imagine how well that would go over in a moment. I mean, even in that day, it would have been like, um, you're dead. Like off with your head in prison. I mean, I don't know what. It would never fly. Nobody would do that. But that's how they're treating God. They're treating God in a way that has lowered the expectation and has lowered uh, just this realm of what that looks like. And, and, and God says, you, you are dishonoring me as you do this. Okay, pause. Let's think this through for a moment. So maybe you're listening to me this morning and you're tracking, or maybe you're like, Jim, what in the world does this have to do with us? Like, we don't do that. I, I don't bring lambs. I don't bring, you know, goats. I don't bring sacrificial things. So this actually has nothing to do with us, right? Well, it is all fulfilled in Christ. But the Bible does say that we still do this. It tells us in Romans that we bring our lives as a living sacrifice. The Christian's life is as if to say, God, this is for you. I'm going to offer you me. And it tells us in Christ, we are offering up spiritual sacrifices. We are living our lives in a way that as if we're bringing the things we do and we're saying, God, this is for you. Uh, this is for where you are. Could it be that we live in such a lukewarm age, which is what the Bible says there in that passage in Revelation 3, uh, in this age where there's neither hot nor cold, could it be that we're in such a space that that's the norm and it's now acceptable? And, and, and we accept it because it's just there. Well, I think it is. And, and if so, I want to just kind of give you a few thoughts. Now, right here, these are going to be just pure opinion. So I just want to tell you, you have full reason to absolutely disagree with everything I'm about to say. Uh, you might say it differently. You might, you know, and that's fine. I just want you to think it through. And if it's helpful, think it through with me. What would this look like on our day? Well, it certainly would be true in giving. We'll talk more about that because it's going to deal with it later in the book of Malachi. But we live in such a space that for the majority of Christians in our world today, uh, they, don't. Uh, they don't. They don't give. They don't give consistently. They don't give appropriately. Most Christians tip God. 
Uh, they just give God a little bit, you know, I mean, kind of whatever that is. And there's just this space that God says, really, like that's honoring me. Wow. I mean, could you imagine this in the same conversation? Like treat the IRS like that and see how it goes over with you. You know, send them, hey, here's 20. It's all I could do, you know, but we're good, right? I mean, like that's going to like the IRS can be like, yeah, well, thanks. No, they're going to be like, you know, we're, you're in trouble. Like we're going to take out, you're going to take, we're going to take everything from you and more. I mean, it would never fly. And yet in our world, we're kind of like, hey, you know, you, you know, God, he's kind of cool with, you know, just whatever we can do. And, and we have this low space. Think about it in church attendance. Now, I'm, I'm probably stepping on toes. So let's just be clear. We're talking about the first service. You guys are good. Just kidding. No, I mean, um, so, uh, I, no, I really don't want to, I just want to say, I just want you to think about where we are in our world today. And church attendance has become something across the nation, specifically here in the United States, something that's very, very different. Now, as I say this again, full grace. Hey, there's reasons at times where people can't attend. Uh, There's reasons where people are sick and unwell. If you're online right now, there is just no condemnation. If that's on, I mean, you're like, I can't attend. I would attend. Full grace. That's grace. But here's the deal. We live in such a world that for most Christians, church attendance is sporadic and occasional and most of the time, there's really not a good excuse. Uh, most time, it's more like, hey, there was a game on, you know, wasn't really feeling it today, kind of had a headache, uh, you know, just wasn't just in, you know, I mean, I just, you know, we thought we'd take a drive, you know, kind of deal. So here's how it works, even for our church. Again, just trying to speak as clearly as I can. See, we have enough people that attend this church regularly uh, that we know come. If everybody shows up on the same Sunday, we are in so much trouble. I just want you to, I mean, I just want you to understand that I, you might not know that. You may, you might be thinking, hey, this is, you know, you know, but here's the deal. If everybody were to pick the same Sunday to show up on, we could probably fill three services uh, and, 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 st- and, and, and have every chair filled. But you know what? It just never happens. It just never happens. Uh, it just, it just, I mean, it just never happens. I mean, we just like, you know, it's just, you know, there are some that are here every week. We know who you are. And then there are others that are like, Hey, it's every other week. It's one every three weeks. It's every four weeks. Uh, and it just kind of moves in such a space. And so, we, but, but here's where we are from, for some of us, we're like, but that's really good. Like we're doing great. Like we are doing fine, you know? And, and even though our, you know, our, our, our focus on God, what we're giving him costs us so little, it's so, you know, and if we could use the same kind of metaphor that God was using, hey, try that with your boss. Go to your boss and be like, hey, you know, I'll come in about, you know, every other day, you know, kind of when I feel like it, you know, but if I have a headache, you know, it's probably not going to happen, you know, and, uh, you know, I felt like taking a drive today, so I just thought I wouldn't come into work, you know, and uh, just, you know, I mean, if we treated our, I mean, like you wouldn't have a job. And, and God's like, you don't even treat me as good as you would treat your boss. Like you treat me less than you would treat the most natural people. Okay, so just track with me more. Let me just keep kind of rifting across these things. What about even number of services? So you probably are aware, but most churches in our land in America today only have one service a week. Most churches have gotten down to they only have a Sunday morning. Now we have a Wednesday night and we have a Sunday evening prayer meeting, but that's fairly exceptional. And yet here's the thing. For most people, they're like, that's amazing. Like, if I go to church once a week, that's a big deal. It just hasn't always been this way. It wasn't that long ago. For some of you, it was in your lifetime that you can remember. Boy, I remember when church was Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday night. I mean, and, and you just, you just, you just did, when church was a big section of our life and slowly it's eroded where it's not that way. In fact, even in those spaces, it was less than it used to be. So if I could take you back to, you know, like some of the really big moments in history where God was moving powerfully, like in the days of like Charles Spurgeon. In his days, you had Sunday morning service, which was absolutely packed then many of the churches had a Sunday afternoon service. It did not last as long or go as many, but some of them did. And then they had a Sunday evening service, which was packed. In fact, in that culture at that time, sometimes Sunday evening was more attended than Sunday morning by the world. And so it was really your evangelistic service, but it was packed. Then you'd have a Monday evening prayer meeting that was packed. Most of the chairs filled, which is crazy. Like we have, I mean, our prayer meetings, yeah, no, that's, it doesn't look like that. Um, uh, but they were packed. And then you'd have Wednesday night. And then they had another prayer meeting on Thursday night. And then Friday night was when you did 
uh, kind of this educational spaces. So if you know people like Martin Lloyd-Jones or G. Campbell Morgan, that's when they taught through the Bible. I mean, they kind of did like classes where they kind of did it. And it's, you know, laid into our day where we have commentary series from them. But here in our day, we have none of that. And yet we feel really good about it. I don't know if I'm making sense, but let me try one other way. So someone did it this way in some stats. And they took kind of the last hundred years and how people handled their free time. Like how that happened. So if we could go back to the 1930s, like almost 100 years ago, you would look at how people spent their time. The majority of their time was spent with their family, school, friends, neighbor. Church was right around 10%. Uh, it got about 10% of their, of, of their life was invested uh, into that, and then they spent it everything else. But from that point to this point, it's radically changed. So just kind of follow along the graph. So in about 10 years' time, as we head towards the, the, the 1940s, church falls to about 8%. Uh, as we continued moving through that space, heading into the 50s and 60s, it fell even more felt it, you know, 6, 5% in the midst of it, you know, just much less than about half of what it was back in the 30s, continued to move into the 70s, uh, into the 80s as we're heading there, and something radically happened that changes our world. We end up, begin to find the ability to go online. And as that begins to move to the 80s and 90s, that begins to grow for most people. Heading to around 2000, that begins to move 5, 10 percent. You know, moving you know, now into the 2010, moving to you know, now heading towards 2024, you know, it has moved into such a space that for the average person, they spend about 60 percent of their free time online. Uh, that, that that occupies the majority of their space. And did you notice where church fell? Two percent. I mean, it's fallen into a space that it is way lower than it was. And yet here's the thing. Again, maybe I'm not talking to you. Maybe I'm talking to you. We feel good about it. Like, man, I go to church once a week. It is so costly. I mean, I, I, I do so much for God. I really, I am so radically, you know, living for him. And it's like, really? Like, really? I mean, no, we're really not. We live in a, in a world where it has become acceptable uh, to be mediocre, and, and in some ways it's fallen so low. Now, we could talk about it and everything else. We could talk about Bible reading and prayer and worship and serving. We could talk about unholy offerings, that we don't even try to live holy lives in many ways as we bring to them these things. And all of these things finds us, honestly, I, I think, living in the same age, living in an age where we are bringing to God that which he was like, really? Like, you don't even treat me like you would treat anybody else. You, where's my honor? Like, if I'm God, if I'm the holy God, where, where is this space where you really recognize who I am, where you really recognize what that's like? And, and he asked this question. He spoke it of the governor. He says, would he be pleased with you? Would, you, would the world accept you favorably? Uh, and then he continues it in verse 9. He says, but now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done with your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord. So the New King James renders it a little bit roughly, uh, but the idea is this. He's picturing, so you, he says, your people are coming like, God, give us grace, be kind to us. He's like, really? So you're expecting that you know, you're wanting God to be gracious while this is what you're doing, like how that's going. And he asked, would God accept you favorably? And the answer is 100%. No, he's saying, I, I can't accept that. So we go back to that passage like we, we, we looked at a moment ago and we thought about it in Leviticus where he said, you know, if you're going to offer a sacrifice of your own free will without blemish, you had to bring it. Sheep, goats, cattle, whatever it is, with it, whoever has a defect, it shall not be acceptable. He says, you give me that, I can't accept it. I will not accept it. He goes on to say it this way, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. God is saying, this isn't acceptable. Like, I can't accept that. And that's why he's inviting you and I to process this through for a moment. So again, breathe with me for a moment, and then let me ask you a question. I wonder how you see this. I mean, I wonder how you're hearing what the conversation that God is having. It could happen a few ways. Some of you tuned me out a little while ago. You're like, this has nothing to do with my world. Uh, I just want to tell you, it does. It really, really does. Tune back in. Some of you are sitting here this morning, and you're like, that's not me, though. 
Like that, I, I mean, I'm not that person. I'm doing better than that. You know, I mean, I, I'm grateful. I mean, when I think about that, I'm, I'm grateful for him. And you feel pretty good about where you are. I mean, honestly, some of you are there. Some of you are hearing me. And right now you're thinking, ouch. And so here's what you're thinking. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. That's what I'm going to do. Like, I, have, I, I do not honor God the way I should honor him. Like, I am probably, yeah, okay, God, I'm going to give it, you know, I'm going to double my effort. Like, I'm going to work a little bit harder. And I want to tell you, if any of those are your response, I think you got it wrong. I think you got it wrong. Why? Well, let's think it through in the most simple way. For us here in the New Testament, us living in this moment, it is always about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. Jesus said, you search the scripture because you think you have life in them. They all are pointing to me. Like everything is pointing to me. And you and I are meant to follow this to Jesus. So let's do that for a moment. Let's, let's think about what we would do and how we would do that. One of the keys for us is we're reading from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, God tells us, is a tutor that is supposed to help us understand how badly we need Jesus and take us to him. I mean, it's supposed to do that. So it would give it to us this way in Galatians. It says, for as many as are the works of the law that are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. It says, here's the essence of the law. You better be perfect. If you don't do all that God is saying, if you can't do all of this, hey, God's curse lands on you. In fact, he goes on to say, is the law, the Old Testament, what we're reading in these places, against the promises of God? I mean, is this kind of arguing against who God is and his faithfulness? No way, certainly not. Scripture has confined all under sin. It's made us so that we recognize, oh man, I'm in trouble. Like, we're all under sin. Like, we are so much there so that the promise by, you know, that by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That's meant to draw us to Christ. He says, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. He says, this was given to us like a tutor. You guys know what a tutor is, right? That's where you were struggling in school, uh, you know, and you, you know, couldn't seem to pass your math class or whatever. And they got you a tutor that sat down with you personally and said, let me help you. Like, let's get you up to speed. And so here's the Old Testament that wants to take you by the hand and says, kind of, let me, let, me, let me take you to Jesus. Like, you need help, and I need, to, I need to show you how much you need help because you don't get it. Like, you, you don't understand how badly you need Jesus. So the Old Testament, part of its thing is to absolutely teach us of our entire desperation upon Christ. Now, that's true for the entirety of the Old Testament, but as we're here in the last book, of the Old Testament. It really is the key. I mean, the Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi, and Malachi is gazing forward to the hope that's only found in Christ. I mean, it's so much of this book points to the promise that we need a Savior. It is towards Jesus' first coming, but also a second, that we're looking to Jesus and we're saying, we just need Jesus. And so partly what he just did for us what the intention of this message this morning is in one sense just to help us understand God's holy standard undoes all of us. I mean, not just a little bit, entirely. I think about verses like some of you were thinking about it already this morning as we talked, where in Isaiah it says, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness, all of our righteousness that we're going to bring in, it's like a filthy rag. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So here's what the Bible's telling us. You're in trouble for the sins that you've committed, if you don't know Jesus. I mean, like, whatever that is, the guilt of God lies upon you. And, and that's true. But here's the problem. For some of us, we're like, well, if you murder somebody, or you steal, yeah, that, that, you're going to get that. But here's what he just did. He didn't talk about any of those things. We're not talking about all the things they were doing wrong, and certainly they were. He says, let's talk about the things you're doing right. Let's talk about the things that you do, that you are doing for God. And he says, it's not acceptable. You, you, you do so in such a way that dishonors me. You do so in such a way that is less than who I am. And if all we dealt with you is on the basis of your good works, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because it's not going to work for you. It's not going to work out for you. And so God's holy standard, it undoes us. And what we find in Scripture is that God doesn't change that. 
He has set his standard up here to perfection, and he doesn't grade on the curve for 2024. Like, well, okay, you know, I'll take what I can get. You know, it's like, you know, you got to, he's like, no, my standard's still here. My standard is still here. And so what do you do with that? Well, it drives us to our need for Christ. And I just want to say it this way. If you're here this morning and you're a person that doesn't yet know Jesus, here becomes the great danger. And here's what it is. This casual Christianity that may be more common in our generation than ever before might keep you from actually being saved. I want to say this as carefully. But boy, as clearly as I can, God give me power to say it. If you're here this morning and the basis of your righteousness is you, you're in so much trouble. But here's how it works. You might be here and honestly, you're thinking it's too so. Like, I, you know, I'm not a murderer. I mean, really, I, 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 don't, I don't steal. I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't lie on my taxes too much. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm a pretty good person. I try to help people. I, I give things to people in the, you know, who are, you know, I help people across the street. I mean, really on, on the basis of it, I think, I think I'm doing pretty good. I mean, compared to the rest of the world. I mean, if you were to look at the rest of the world, I mean, on the scheme of things, look, I go to church on Sunday morning. I go to Calvary Chapel. I mean, I, that's, that's got to count for something. And we, and we, and we look on our lives and we, and we look at that as our righteousness, but here's what he's telling us. Here's the problem. That, that, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Sometimes, when, when people think about it this way, they will say it that way, right? I mean, maybe you have, maybe you know somebody, and even if they don't say it out loud, they will say, well, I'm hoping that my good works will outweigh my bad. It's a terrible idea. It doesn't work. I mean, you're guilty for, for your bad works, but let's just assume it was so. Let's just assume that at the end of the time, it, we're, we're going we're gonna to weigh your works. And so we're going to get one of those scales out here. And on one side, we're going to put everything you've done wrong, like all the bad things you've done. And if on the other side, all that you've done good outweighs it, hey, you, well, then maybe God will be good to you. And maybe you'll get to go to heaven. Let's just say it worked that way. Okay, so everything you've done, every word you've ever spoken is going to be over on this side. But here's the problem. So as we're looking for some things to put over on the positive side, God says, I'll tell you what, hey, if you've done it in a way that you, were, you did recognize who I am, you did it in a holy, word, unholy way, I won't accept anything you've done. And if you've given me something that's less than who I am, everything that you're offering is tainted. So that we begin to discover if we were to do that, if we were to lay out the scale system, here's what I want you to understand. Over on the right side of thing, you have nothing. I mean, there's not anything there because even your good works are over on the bad because they've been tainted by your, by your selfishness and your flesh so that even the good things that you do, the good offerings you bring, they, they leave you undone. And so the gospel is telling us, hey, we, we, we need to see this so that it helps us understand how much we need Jesus. Jesus said it this way. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do the things I say. You say I'm your master, but you don't treat me as I am. You don't listen to anything I have to say. And he says there's going to be a generation of people who are going to come before him in that day, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And he says, then I'm going to tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It is to me one of the most terrifying realities that exists. There's a group of people, and maybe in this generation, a lot of them who think because they go to church and they call God Lord, they're going to make it. Well, like, you know, I'm a pretty good guy, pretty good girl. I, I try to do good. I even go to church. I do some things. And guys, I say, but I didn't know you. Did you think it was about your good works? I mean, I've invited you into a relationship with me because that's the only way this is going to work. In Ephesians, when it talks about the gospel, it tells us that we've been predestined to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us acceptable, accepted in the beloved. And that was the question that God asked. He asked it twice. Will you be accepted? Will you be accepted if you're going to stand in, in what you've done? And here's the answer. No, you will not. But the only way to be accepted, and you are accepted, is if we come to Christ, that we recognize that it's him that we need, that we're driven to this place where we'd say, you know, I, I need Jesus. I mean, I'm, I'm in trouble. 
Like I'm in trouble, not just because of the bad things I've done, but I can't do good things. I can't do anything without it being messed up. I'm, my selfishness, my sinfulness, it taints everything so that I'm driven to my absolute need of Jesus. Hey, with all my heart, I just want to tell you, it's just you. We're pleading with you. Again, the, the dangerous thing is that for some of you, you have a quasi-righteousness that in this world looks exceptional. I mean, you're like, I give 2% of my time to Jesus. <laughs> like, I'm really, really amazing. You know, and really compared to everybody else, you might be. But you're not. You're, you're in trouble. You're, you're in trouble for everything you've done wrong and for even the stuff you've tried to do right, it leaves you undone. And if you didn't know how much trouble you are in, part of the book of Malachi is to say, you're in so much trouble. Like, I mean, you're, you're in trouble for all your, I mean, just on your good stuff, you're in trouble and you just need Jesus. I mean, you absolutely need a radical relationship with him. And, and if that's you this morning, we're just doing everything we can to say, I hope you get it. And I hope you come to him. But it's not just for unbelievers, right? I mean, part of this whole thing is he's talking to people who are supposed to be his people. He's certainly talking to us as his people. And the danger is the casual Christianity that we live in leaves us in the same space. Where we kind of look at what we're doing and, again, we still kind of, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I try. I mean, surely God's going to be okay with that. And somehow we find ourselves thinking we're doing better than we are. I go back to that passage in, in, in Revelation where Jesus says, you know, but you say I'm rich, I'm, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing. You don't know how wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked you are. I mean, he just tells us, hey, that's the problem. And here's where I want to try to say it again. Hey, we live in that generation. And the scary thing is not the stuff that you recognize that, that's wrong, it's the stuff that you don't. Uh, you know, again, if I were to ask you, like, hey, what's wrong? Like, what, what would be wrong with your life that God would say, I'm not comfortable, I don't like that, let's forgive that, let's cleanse us, let's deal with it. There's a lot. You may deal with it. But what about you don't know? I mean, what about the spaces where you feel okay? Now, you might never say that. Probably you wouldn't come here this morning and say, I'm rich, wealthy, I've needed nothing. But you might say, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, I'm doing pretty good. Things are, things are all right. I'm all right. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, it's this place where you don't realize how much you need Jesus. You, you need Jesus for everything. You're, you're, you're such a mess and you are so broken that you desperately, desperately, desperately need Jesus. Jesus said it this way. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, you could bear much fruit. Without me, you can do Nothing? Nothing? nothing. Every good thing you do outside of him, it's unacceptable. It's impossible. And part of the problem is that we hear it and maybe we don't believe it. I mean, here's the thing. You need Jesus so much. I mean, you need Jesus for everything. I, you know, I, I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee, you know, kind of thing. Like, Lord, teach me that I, that I need you to, I need you in moments. I need, because I, you know, I can't do any of it without you. I am so tainted and broken. I am desperately in need of Christ. But that's what he's inviting us to understand. This incredible space that we'd come in. If you would get there, you would join the Apostle Paul who sees the same reality. And he says in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God. This is Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, I'm in so much trouble. Wretched man that I am. I, I, I can't do anything. I can't do anything right. I can't do it in my own strength. Where am I going to go? I'm going to go to Jesus. He is my answer. He is my salvation. He is my forgiveness, but he is my enablement. I need him so much. I, I need him so much. And so part of what's meant to be happening here is that we're supposed to be understanding how much we need him. Maybe you do. Maybe I'm saying something that really doesn't apply, but I, I think it does. So let's try it another direction. I'm worried that we find acceptable so much less. And we would be content with so much less. Let's just think about it for our nation for a moment. So we have an election in a couple of days. 
There's going to be a president selected. I voted. I hope you have as well. I think you should. We should pray and ask God to, to, to put into office whoever he has. But then I want to say as kindly as I can, I'm concerned that no matter which way it goes, it's not going to go good for us. It's not what we really need. That, that, that what we really need is a revival. What we really need is people turning to Jesus. Uh, it, it's not going to work. If we could legislate some morality in our nation, we're still in trouble. So let's just imagine. Again, just, we're just playing make-believe for a moment. Let's say in the next four years, we had a radical turning uh, towards morality in a couple ways. Like maybe we really did push through and we made abortion illegal across the entire United States, except for the exceptions that, that might be in there. Hey, we could talk about those, but hey, let's just say that it became just patently illegal everywhere. I mean, for some of us, I mean, that, that's just a, a huge deal. We think of, man, that's one of the things that marks us as a nation is that abortion is legal. And you're right. Let's just say we could get rid of it. Let's say we went further and we really did incredible things to, to, to stop human trafficking. And, and we really did some incredible things to deal with, you know, drugs coming into our nation. And, and we fixed some of those things. And in some pretty incredible ways, would we then be acceptable as a nation? No. No. Because it's not just the bad things. It's that God says, boy, there's an irreverence. You guys don't, you, you don't honor me. We are still in trouble. But here's the problem. I'm afraid that for many of us here in the room, we'd be great with that. Oh, that'd be great. It'd be great if we could get rid of abortion. And it would be, I mean, we would be, we would be smoking. I mean, like this, we'd be a righteous nation. It's like, uh, actually not. Until there's a turning to Christ, it will never happen that way. Now, here's the deal. I, I don't get a chance to talk to the nation. I don't have a voice to it, but I get to speak to you. And my concern is that you're in the same space. Some of you are struggling with some things here this, this morning. Just, just be how, right you are. Maybe you're struggling with anger. Maybe you're struggling with jealousy. Maybe you're struggling with lust. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction of some kind. Maybe alcohol. Or drug. And, and if we could get rid of that in your life, and by God's grace, he can. I just want to tell you, he can. He fixes those things. But I'm convinced that for some of you, you would be happy if you just stopped doing that. And you would be convinced that you would be like... Pfft. That's, all, that's the only thing that's messing me up. I mean, like, if I could just not be that way, God would be, like, so happy with me. And he's like, actually not. Um, because, you know, if you're thinking about how you see me, it's not you, everything is tainted. You, you need me, not just to deal with the bad things in your life. You need me for everything. You, you need me for everything that you are. And it's as if you could finally see it again. You would say with the Apostle Paul, like, where do I go? And, and you'd be like, Jesus. And then you turn to Christ and you'd be like, Jesus, I can't do anything without you. And again, if we're just kind of imagining this as a conversation, Jesus was like, I told you that already. Like, didn't I already tell you that? Didn't I already tell you that without me, you can do nothing? I mean, like this shouldn't have been brand new information for you. You should have been in the space of like, God, I can't do, I just, I need you. I need you for everything. I need you. I need you constantly. I'm, I have a greater need for Christ than I ever knew I had. I have a greater need for him than I ever knew even existed. But Christ is a greater savior than you've ever imagined. And he's inviting us to know him. He's inviting us to say, God, I need you. I need you so big. I need you so badly. And, and, and not to settle for this casual religious space. Where in Malachi's day, they're like, hey, at least they brought sacrifices. I mean, they might be sick and lame, and, but they brought something. No, I mean, there's a space where he's inviting us to Christ, where he's telling us, hey, we need him. And so the Old Testament is meant to convince us, to convince us of our great need of Christ. And maybe you already knew that, and maybe I've said nothing more than you already knew, but maybe for one person this morning, you would come to the place of like, okay, I knew I needed him. I just didn't know how badly I needed him. I mean, I, I kind of thought if I could just not do those really bad things, that I would be okay. But now you're telling me that my righteousness, uh, my, my, my offerings, my thing, that if they're tainted, they're unacceptable, I can't do anything without him. And then we'd say, yes, that's exactly right. You need Jesus. You need him so, so badly. And, and all that you attempt to do on your own is, is a failed attempt. So we invite you to Christ. We invite you to see this where God would say, hey, there's a, there's a lack of this. And if all these things would convince you, it would lead you to Christ in a beautiful in real life. 
Well, we need to end there. So you can close your Bibles, your notebooks, whatever it is you have open. And I just want to invite you into a moment of prayer. And I don't know how this has landed. Again, in some ways, it just there's so much happening in our world at this moment. But this is so relevant to right where we are. Again, I want to say, if you don't know Jesus, you, you need him right now. You need to be saved. We say it with love and kindness that, that God sees it. And, and the only way to be acceptable is in Christ. That nobody's going to make it any other way. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He's the life. Nobody is coming to the Father any other way. And if you don't have him, if you're not his, and you're not in a personal relation with Jesus, then this morning we're going to give you a moment and pray and ask you to pray. For my brothers and sisters that you know Jesus, I just want to try to say it one more time. You need him more than you thought you did. Part of the problem right now is you are ignorant of how desperate you are for him. You might think, but is it, we, we, we need him for everything. And sometimes we just have to have that kind of the, the light pull back and say, here, we just look off on these things and just show us how badly you need him. And if it works rightly, you could run to Jesus. You'd be like, Jesus, I need you. Like, I, like, I need you for all of my life. We should invite you to that and that that would be where you are now. And that he would invite you into that space. Would you take a quiet moment? Just talk to God about that just for a quick second. I'll do the same. And then we're going to close in worship. But just wherever that's landed, just talk to God about what he's talking to you about. God, thank you for your word that is meant to do us good. Even your just very clear reasoning with that generation in Malachi's day. And if I'm right, with this generation that you say in those last days, there's going to be a great apostasy. There's going to be a great lukewarmness that's going to permeate the world. I think we're there. And God, I just cry out for it right now that you would wake people up. Um, you'd wake up those that don't know you who think they're okay. Who are able to do the basics of what Christianity looks like today and think they're acceptable. And they're not. All their sin is, is, is laid to bear, but even all their good works are tainted. God, draw them to, to see that they need you, Jesus, that the only way for life. The only way to be accepted is in Christ. May they pursue, know, and find you. God, for those of us who know you, maybe just coming and just saying, I think we, since I just, I just want to say it, Lord, I feel like a lukewarm pastor and a lukewarm generation and a lukewarm world. Lord, we, we fail so much at living where, what is up to your standard and even coming close. God, forgive us. Forgive us where we try in our own might and, and we fail to, with humility, come and say, God, I can't do any of this without you. I, I can't have anything that, that works, that merits, that's life-giving. I can't bear fruit, Jesus, without you. We need you. We need you more than we thought we did. But thank you, God, you are more than we've ever imagined. Draw us to it, to our great need of Christ. And I thank you that you are a greater Savior yet still. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. We bless you this morning and we honor you. Jesus, we do it in your name. Amen.